The buildings and streets of New York City's Lower East Side clamor with religious, social, economic, and political history that provides a meaningful backdrop to Melanie Crowder's audacity. Peering into Clara Lemlich's neighborhood, we understand the influences that motivated her decision to become a fighter for workers' rights. Tenements, factories, public schools, libraries, squares, and parks, they were the places dreams were made, voiced, or set ablaze. And they are where Clara found her identity identity and purpose. Despite the squalor conditions, tenements were a refuge for immigrants escaping religious persecution in their home countries. They were built to cheaply accommodate the influx of immigrants in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Five stories high, apartments had kitchens, but they were no bigger than 400 square feet, lacked electricity and private bathrooms. Yet the affordability of tenements allowed families to sustain themselves. Similar cultural backgrounds created a sense of mutual support. And for Clara's family, tenements served as a fresh start to a life with hope and freedom. New York mandated elementary education fed Clara's aspiration to attend school and become a doctor, but reality served up barriers from which Clara could not break away. On the corners of Hester and Ludlow stands Public School 42. Built in 1898, it opened its doors to immigrant kids. It adorned big windows, creating airy, light-filled classrooms that served as a healthy alternative to tenement life. By 1903, New York City introduced a curriculum that submerged kids in practical English, taught them good citizenship, proper hygiene, and vocational skills like sewing, but not the rigors of math, science, and literature that Clara desired. The goal of the curriculum was to create responsible, polite, clean, and orderly citizens, not produce scholars. In keeping with Jewish tradition that prohibited girls from attending school, Clara's father insisted that she instead get a job to support the family. Like most immigrants at that time, education was secondary to working. Clara was forced to forge an independent path to education that included night classes after work. Consequently, what school once represented to Clara and her aspirations soon slipped into something increasingly unattainable. Clara worked at a sweatshop sewing clothes and seeds of change. Abusive factory owners forced girls to endure dangerous conditions under the constant threat of being fired. Clara resolved to fight these unjust practices by organizing a union. Founded in 1900, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, previously headquartered on 16th Street off Fifth Avenue, is seen here. The union represented thousands of predominantly Jewish garment workers taking a stand on fair pay, safe work environments, and employee rights. Speaking Yiddish, Clara convinced some of her Jewish co-workers to join the cause. As Clara's support grew, so too did her voice. She built momentum across cultures. She inspired action over fear. She led laborers into movement. Clothing to Clara signified both dread and aspiration. She toiled sewing the clothes that supplied department stores in her neighborhood, but that she herself could not afford. Ridley Department Store on Grand Street was one such store. It stood out from other buildings in the neighborhood because it was pink, ornate, and it fashioned big windows. It catered to the uptown middle class, but was situated just a stone throw away from the side street tenements and factories where poor immigrant garment workers like Clara lived and worked. 
Clara observed that well-dressed women with hats garnered attention and respect, so she aspired to dress well. She sewed together scraps of fabric and a feather she found in the street to don her own hat as a mark of earned status, an indicator that she was a respectable part of her new American culture. Seward Park Library gave Clara the sanctum to briefly forget her grueling world and fuel her intellect. There she found book collections in both English and Russian. The library was donated in 1909 by Andrew Carnegie and thoughtfully centered within the central part of the Jewish immigrant community. Located on East Broadway, flanked by Seward Park, which you see here, and a block from the Jewish Daily Forward Building and Strauss Square, the library sat smack in the middle of recreation, news, culture, politics, and labor movement buzz. So perhaps Clara's sanctum also fueled her spirit to spark change in the sweatshops. Clara traveled lightly on her journey to the United States, but she carried her hard left political views with her. Strauss Square is a strip of land near Seward Park where the streets of Canal, Essex, and East Broadway meet. This plot of land is small but significant because it served as a gathering spot to express community views. Speeches, rallies, and protests touting the virtues of socialism occurred regularly. Working class Jewish immigrants considered socialism in alignment with American ideals since it advocated for labor rights, women's rights, and free speech. This square is where a lot of the labor movement developed, especially the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Clara's views echo the values of many Eastern European immigrants living in New York City's Lower East Side. Socialism in New York City shine brightest on the Forward Building. As the first paper in America to focus on news and advice for the Yiddish-speaking community, the Jewish Daily Forward printed in English and Yiddish. And four faces of socialism carved into the facade. Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Karl Liebknecht, and Ferdinand LaSalle greeted visitors. In addition to the paper, the building housed charitable organizations and a Yiddish theater. Clara and the majority of Eastern European immigrants brought their liberal ideals with them. The buildings and organizations in the community reflected these ideals. Clara cared about fairness and equality for working class citizens. Socialism gave Clara the vehicle to drive these values forward. Leisure and recreation evaded Clara, but on one rare free winter Sunday, Clara and her friend Pauline left the chaotic Lower East Side, hopped on a bus with a cup of hot mulled cider that Clara purchased with her own money, and headed uptown to Central Park. Developed in 1958, Central Park offered quiet green space as a response to the rapidly growing city and its influx of immigrants. Reminiscent of her secret playful Saturdays dancing in the woods with Hannah and Miriam, Clara reveled in the park's nature and her newly found independence.
culminating years as a Jewish daughter who refused to be good and obedient, opting instead to educate herself and stand up against abuse and oppression is a short but powerful speech that Clara delivered to thousands of garment workers gathered at the Great Hall at Cooper Union. She called on them to strike. The Great Hall was constructed in 1858 for the purpose of providing a place where public discourse could find a home. 20,000 predominantly female Jewish garment workers went on strike in 1909, resulting in union contracts that dictated better working hours, wages, and conditions. The 20,000 uprising that Clara set in motion triggered organizing activity across the country, and it cemented Clara's identity and purpose as a courageous advocate for workers' rights. On March 25, 1911, a match fell on a sweatshop floor, setting ablaze the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory and the dreams of the 146 people killed. Currently part of New York University's campus, the Brown Building housed the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Illegally locked doors trapped workers inside. Passersby in Washington Square Park witnessed the horrific scene. Clara's appeal for workplace reform, including fire safety, gained wider attention and propelled her into the public's eye. Clara expanded her advocacy beyond sweatshops into social and political causes to which she dedicated the rest of her life. The New York City buildings and places that touch Clara's world add perspective to Crowder's text. Strolling through Lower East Side history, we understand how religion, economics, and politics influence Clara's values and actions. We grasp why Clara decided to trade her dream of becoming a doctor for a life dedicated to activism. Examining historical context sheds light on how Clara's identity and purpose evolved and the text in the origin of her audacity.